Uh, Second Samuel, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord. Uh, there's, he's blessed us in so many ways. He's blessed us in so many ways. On the inside page, out of 1 Thessalonians, it says rejoice evermore. These are commandments of God. This is, he's telling us this is what we should be doing. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body will be preserved, blameless, under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy brotherly kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And that's Paul. Paul's uh, closing summation. And then on the back page, Invisible Influence. On a visit to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., I saw a masterpiece called The Wind. The painting showed a storm moving through the wooded area. Tall, thin trees leaned to the left. Bushes thrashed in the same direction. In an even more powerful sense, the Holy Spirit is able to sway believers in the direction of God's goodness and truth. If we go along with the Spirit, we can expect to become more courageous and more loving. We will also become more discerning about how to handle our desires. In some situations, however, the Spirit nudges us towards spiritual growth and change, but we respond with a no. Continually stonewalling the conviction of what the Scripture calls quenching the Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit, over time things were once considered wrong appear to be quite as bad, not quite as bad. When our relationship with God seems distant and disconnected, this may be because the Spirit's conviction has been repeatedly brushed aside. The longer this goes on, the harder it is to see the root of the problem. Thankfully, we can pray and ask God to show us our sin. If we turn away from sin and recommit ourselves to Him, God will forgive us and revive the power and the influence of His Spirit within us. God, show me how I resisted your Holy Spirit. Help me to listen when you speak. I want to be right with you again. Yielding to the Holy Spirit leads to right living. Awesome bulletin, honey. We have Pastor's Appreciation Day next uh, next Sunday. I think it's pretty cool that the Christian world does that. Uh, if you get on WDLM or Caleb or anything, we all recognize October is Pastor Appreciation Month, but I got one problem with it. It should be Pastor's Appreciation and Wife's Month. And I've said that ever since the day I, I got saved. It's, 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 uh, when I got saved, I asked Patty, you know, the Lord, when Jesus called me to be a pastor, I asked her, if she was willing to do this with me. And I said, if we're going to do it, I want to do it 100%. And she agreed, and she'd been my, at my side ever since. This sounds like a speech for next week, but but uh, I just want to show you how cool God is. Um, my message this week, 99 times out of 100, the Lord will give me a message Saturday night. Usually but anywhere between 2 and 6 in the morning. Usually. But the message I'm, I'm bringing uh, today, the uh, Lord gave it to me Saturday morning as I was praying. And uh, usually my prayer time is anywhere from 2 in the morning until 5 or 6, 7 in the morning. And uh, but it, it was special because it, it was a special time he gave it to me, but it, it was a special message. And uh, what's cool about it is, is uh, it's a whole other message in itself. God doesn't always do things the same way. 
you know, and I wish I could preach that message now, but that's not the message you gave me. But, but Jesus didn't save you the same way he saved me. And Jesus didn't call you to serve him in the same way he called me to serve him. Uh, your spiritual journey will be different than my spiritual journey. And how Jesus works in your life will probably be a little bit different than how he works in my life. And, and that's what I, I love about when I got this message Saturday morning. Um, it's just It was different. It was cool. And even last night I was praying and early in the morning. And I was wondering if this was, you know, the message he wanted to bring me. And it was, still was. So um, what's cool about being a pastor, I might have 100,000 messages floating through my head. How long do you pick the right one out? There's no way you can and unless you got Jesus leading you and guiding you to give you the right message, you're not going to bring the right message. But I want us to, to uh, think about some things. We won't turn there, but Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word that proceeds from the mouth. God expects us to know every word in this Bible. And he expects us to live by every word in this Bible. I, I don't even know if, if people really understand. He said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how you know you're, you're in the right church. Because we teach every word. We teach every word from the mouth of God. We teach his salvation. And a lot of people think, oh, I know about Jesus. I got a bunch of family members who think they know about Jesus. And they're not going to make it to heaven. They think they, they, know, they know this much about Jesus, but they don't know enough to get them to heaven. Um, it's a dangerous thing. Little knowledge is dangerous. To think you know is dangerous. We're studying the tabernacle. Probably take us eight or nine months. Most Christians have no idea what the tabernacle is all about. Holy Spirit. Our comforter. Our teacher. The gifts of the Spirit. The rapture, Armageddon, the thousand year reign of Christ. I say that prayer for 38 years. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Never knew what that meant. Thy kingdom come, his, his reign, his thousand year reign. Thy kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the new, new heaven and new earth. The great right throne judgment, the second death. Hell and the lake of fire. Being born again, never heard that. The judgment seat of Christ. He made his kings and priests unto God. Revelation chapter 1. Jesus' covenant with his people. Hebrews 10. Today I'm going to go into something pretty cool. We're going to look at the seven day of creation. You guys know about the seven day of creation? Everybody thinks they know about it. You know what? Let's find out. Let me preach about good. I'm going to preach about good today. Anybody, anybody know about good in, in the seven day creation? Anybody know about good? Let's open up our Bibles. Genesis chapter 1. Seven day creation. See, God commanded us to study the Bible. Not just to read it. Reading is good. Studying is better. But let's look at Revelation chapter 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the earth. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the, the light day and the darkness night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. God said it was good. God said it was good. Let's read about the second day, verse 6 through 8. And God said, there, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the water. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And let's look at the third day. And God said, Let the waters gather under heaven and be gathered together in one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called the sea and God saw that it was good and God said let the earth bring forth 
grass, herb yielding seed, the fruits, the yield fruit after its kind of seed is upon itself on the earth, and it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, the tree yielded fruit, whose seed was in itself after this kind, and God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day. God said it was good. Verse 14, the fourth day. God said that it will be lights in the firmament of the heaven, divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years, and let them be for lights of the firmament of the heaven, and give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser to rule the night. And he made the stars also, and God sent them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and the rule over the day and over the night, and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. In the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The fifth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures as life, follow the fly above the earth and the open firmaments of the heaven. And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the water brought forth abundantly after his kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed him, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let them fowl multiply on the earth. And the evening and the morning was the fifth day. The sixth day, and God let God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures of his kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And on the sixth day, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, over the earth. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created a man in his own image. And the image created him, him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it and dominion over the fish in the sea and the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moved. And let's jump over to verse 31. And God saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. And in the seventh day, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he has made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had, he had rest from all his work which God created and made. So he blessed it. It was good. 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 Did we catch it? Anybody catch it? You catch it? You caught it, honey? All right. You should catch it. <laughs> I'll be with my wife. <laughs> All right. What'd you catch? God never said it was good on the second day. Good. You were good. 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 Honey. God never said it was good. Go back. Let's go back and look. The second day. Okay, um, the second day, Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. And that's what I mean about studying the Bible. We could read this whole thing and just go through and go right on to the next thing. And we missed it. We missed it. And God said, let there be a firmament. That's an expanse in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the water. Let's explain that. You get in my church, you know what it means. There's the water on the earth, and then there's the water... There's an atmosphere, there's a water circle in the earth. Right now, there, there's seven atmospheres. There's, there are six. There was seven. When God destroyed the earth with a flood, he, he broke up that water that surrounded the earth. And the reason man could live to be 900 years old before the flood was because that water that was circling the earth filtered out all the rays from the sun. That's why we get old, because the sun's rays. Well... There was, a, there was a water around the earth, a ferment of water, and that's what he's talking about. The water around the earth and the water on the earth, the seas and the oceans. And God made the firmament and divided the waters that which were under the firmament. A firmament, just think of it as the air or the, of the heaven. The God speaks of three heavens. Our atmosphere is a heaven. Outer space is a heaven. And then where God's kingdom is called the third heaven. Uh, under the firmament where the waters were above and the firmament it was so and God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. Doesn't say it was good, does it? Why? Why? 
Don't answer. <laughs> God never said the second day was good. Here's why. We all know number two is the number of Jesus. It's also the number of division. Jesus one day is going to divide the saved from the lost. He's going to be our judge. What's one of Jesus' titles? We just sang it in this song, Living Water. Living Water. This division from the water from the water represents Jesus going to the cross where Jesus was separated from his Father. That's why there was no good on this day. Every word in this Bible is about Jesus Christ. And this isn't any different. The reason we see two goods, two goods on the third day because there's a resurrection and there's life. But on the second day was when Jesus was on the cross and he was separated from his Father as the waters were divided from the waters. And God didn't call that day good. Most people don't understand the cross. Most people, like I was for 38 years, has a little bit of knowledge about the cross, but they really don't understand the fullness of it. When Jesus was praying in the garden, and he was asking God if there was another way, if he could take this cup from me. Most people think that he didn't want to go to the cross, and that was not what he was talking about. He didn't want to be separated from his Father. That's what he was talking about. Remember when Jesus hung on the cross, and what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God had to turn his back on Jesus Christ because of sin. God had to turn his back on Jesus Christ on sin. You know what he was doing when he was on the cross? He was paying for all of our sins. That's why we can go to heaven. Not because we're a good person. Not because we did this or did that or belong to this religion. Not, we're, going to, we're going to heaven because he paid for all of our sins. I like Robert Morris today. He said people don't go to, go to hell because of sins. They go to hell because of unbelief. How can I sit there and tell two people? I've done it before. I've seen two people come up here, maybe a husband, wife, or uh, mother, son, or whatever, and uh, uh, tell them the same thing. If you ask Jesus Christ to save you, he'll save you and give you a new life. And one person bows his head and says, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins and save me. And the other person says, well, you know, I'm not ready yet. But you know, I've heard a lot of sermons and uh, um, people say Jesus, that we're responsible for Jesus going to the cross. But you know what? You know who's really responsible? Satan. Think about it. There was no sin in the world until Satan showed up, was there? No. Jesus went to the cross because of sin. Satan was the one. Satan was the one. Satan first divided himself from God, didn't he? He separated himself from God. He said, I'm not going to serve you no more. I'm going to be served. And then he came down and wanted to separate God's children from God. In the Garden of Eden. Satan deceived Adam into eating the fruit. Then Adam followed. Causing division, causing separation from God. Can you, do we really understand sin? I don't think we really do. One sin separated Adam and Eve from God. So don't tell me you can be a good person and get to heaven because that's not true. It's just not. It's a lie straight from hell. I hear people say all the time, I'm a good person, I'll get to heaven. You got no idea what the cross is about. You got no idea what sin is about. You don't have any idea about <laughs> what life's about as far as I'm concerned. Because if we don't get to heaven... Your life was just uh, just vanity. It meant nothing. <sighs> Satan's a divider. <laughs> Satan's a divider. He'll keep 
keep people from going to hell. He he doesn't want to serve God, and he doesn't want to have nothing to do with God, and he doesn't want anybody else to either. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 8. Oh, when Bill Sandoval got saved, Satan was mad. Satan was mad. <laughs> Jesus was happy. The Bible says, all the angels of heaven rejoice over one sinner that repented. We're, we we all know, or we should all know the parable of the, of the sower, and, and, the, and, the, and the seed is the word of God. And Jesus is going to explain the parable of the sower. If we look at Luke chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus is going to, Jesus is going to tell you what the parable is all about, so you don't have to be confused. It said, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside, there was four places that the, the sower wanted to plant his seed. The wayside was where you walk the pass between the, the vineyard, the pass everybody walked on, and it got hard as a rock. And then you had the, the seed going into the stony ground, and then you had the seed going into the thorn bushes, and then you had the good seed that went into good ground. So the seed is the word of God. We're preaching the word of God. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's, it's, it's our heart. Those, 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 the wayside, the stony ground, the, the, the thorns, and the good, the good uh, soil it represents the heart of man. Those by the wayside are they which hear. The wayside is a real, real hard ground. The seed can't get in there. The seed can't get in there. You can preach the word of God to them and the seed can't get in there. They, don't, they, they can hear the word of God all day long and, they, and the seed can't get in. It can't get in. Those by the wayside are those that hear, they hear the word of God, then cometh the devil and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Wow. What's Satan doing there? He's trying to separate us from God. He said this, Satan comes and steals that seed so it can't get into their heart and they can't believe and, and be saved. I know when I first got saved, and I came and told my family first. And my mother got saved, and Steve got saved, and Jake and Alex both got saved pretty quick, like within two or three weeks. But my dad, he just, he couldn't get it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And what was good about my dad was he came to our Bible studies, and, and he was looking at the Bible every day. They had a big old table, like a huge table in the dining room that could sit 10 people and it was just full of all the, all their stuff all their Catholic stuff that they had and then the Bible and the stuff that I was giving them and they were looking through everything um, but it took my dad 11 months and I, it's a spiritual battle what we don't understand when somebody's not getting saved it's a spiritual battle look at what it says Satan's taking the word out of their heart well, what are you going to do about that? Ain't nothing we can do about it, but we got a Jesus that can do something about it. So I just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes and let him see. Let him see your salvation. Let him see that he needs to ask you to save him. Look at what it says. Satan takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Satan wants to separate us from God. And then when you get saved, Satan wants to separate you from God. <laughs> he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. He wants to separate you from the mission God has given you. If we go to Matthew chapter 4, he did it to Jesus. If he did it to Jesus, you don't think he's going to do it to you? He did it to Jesus. Remember when Jesus was out in the wilderness? What was he doing? He was preparing to go on his mission to start his mission, his work for God. And Satan comes to him. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. And the tempter came to him and said unto him, 
if thou be the Son of God. He's Satan. He's the angel in heaven. He's been up there for all eternity. He was a worshiper. He led to worship for God in his, in his throne room, in, in his holy, the holy room. And now he tells Jesus, if you're the Son of God, boy, I, you just feel like giving him a crack in the side of the head. If thou be the Son of God, commanded these stones be made bread. Remember, he was fasting for 40 days. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What was Satan trying to do? Get him off the path that God had him on. To do the mission that God had him on to do. Look what it says in verse 9. Satan said, I will give, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. In verse 9, he said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall I serve. And I, I want us to look at verse 11. It's very important. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Don't miss that part. He was under a spiritual battle. He was on. Don't, don't miss that part. The angels came to minister to him. Oh, it wasn't like Jesus just said, oh, yeah, well, I'll take care of that. No, no, no. He was in a spiritual battle. And it was a real battle. So much so that the angels had to come and worship him or minister to him. Yeah, Satan will try to get you off that path. Try to separate you from doing what God called you to do. He did it to me. He did it to me. I've had two, what I call, satanic attacks. And this is what I'll tell you about satanic attacks. Sometimes they're real subtle. You might just not be feeling right about things. You might have some weird, crazy thoughts. But... And I've had those. But I had two really, really, uh, I would call them tsunami type of sat satanic attacks. And the best way I can describe it was an evil heaviness that came upon me and it was like crushing me. Not physically, but spiritually. Um, and one of them was to quit being a pastor. The other one was to divorce my wife. God only set up two institutions in this earth. There's only two institutions that God set up. Marriage and the church. And they're really one if you really want to understand it. Because marriage is the church, isn't it? We're the bride of Christ. Satan tried to get Jesus... Stop the ministry that God had given him. And Jesus, Satan will do the same thing to you. I guarantee you. He'll try and stop you. And separate you from where God's called you to be. Satan wants to separate you from God's people and God's house. Huh? Yeah? What? I don't know. What? What is? What? Let's see what God says. What's God say? Let's go to Hebrews chapter ten. You see, I, I a lot of people just think, well, you know, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and it's everything's going to work out right. No, no, that's not. That's nowhere in the Bible. No, when you do what you want to do, everything is going to work out wrong. And that, there's never, <laughs> that's not going to change. When you do what you want to do, everything is going to work out wrong. And it's not ever going to get better. But in Hebrews chapter 10. Talking about God's church. Verse 23. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, 
That, that's, that's the church. We should be provoking one another unto love and good works. And then he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, the day of his coming. God said, don't forsake church. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The word church is a Greek word that means ecclesia. It means called out assembly. When we don't assemble, when we don't come here, everything God sets up is for our good, for our best. Church, I, people don't come to church, they don't get it. They just don't get it. They, they want their life to be better, but the one thing that God set up to make their life better, they don't want to be a part of it. Think about it. God says go to church. Who do you think say and not go to church? It ain't hard to figure out. And why are we listening to the one who wants to kill, steal, and destroy us? Well, we do. Some do. Let me give you an analogy. In 1 Peter, he says that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking who he could devour, right? Right? Uh, anybody, anybody besides me like the Animal Channel? Yeah, I don't want to watch butterflies and birds. I want to watch lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, you know. What does the lion do? What happens when the lion shows up? What do they do? God sets this up in nature so that we can clearly see it. What does the lion do? They get one and separate them from the rest. You ever see those bulls when they get together? Man, them lions can't touch them bulls. They want to get those calves. Those bulls make a circle. Them big water buffalo and the calves are inside. And man, them lions try to come in and they, they kill them. That's the church. That's a picture of the church. When you're in the middle of the church, there's safety. When you're out there by yourself, that's who the lion's going to get. Same with sheep, isn't it? Same with sheep. Why did Jesus leave the 99 and go look for one lost sheep? Because he knew that sheep was going to be dead within a couple of days. A sheep separated from the flock will be dead within a couple of days. It won't be good for him. Do we, do we see this? Are we seeing that this is the church? This is our place of protection right here. When we're not a part of this, we're outside of God's protection. It's a clear picture. Who doesn't want you to come to church? Satan? <sighs> Satan wants to separate us from God's people, God's church, God's purpose. He wants to separate us from God's word. From God's word. If he can separate you from God's word, he's got you. He's got you. What's the word called? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. I, I, I wish people could really understand God, understand the spiritual life. It's a war. It's a war. Uh, we've been at war with Satan. God's been at war with Satan. We're at war with Satan. Paul even tells us. Paul even tells us. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Look what Paul tells us. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Does, does that sound like we're strong? <laughs> no. No. We, we ain't got no strength. We got no strength to, to resist Satan and, and all he's trying to destroy in our life. He said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the power of God. We, we, he lives in us and he is our power. And then... Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not a natural, it's not a physical battle. But we war against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's all spiritual satanic power right there. We have a war against Satan and all his spiritual satanic power. But look what he says. He talks about the armor of God. Okay, we're not going to read all that. You can read it all. But look what he says in verse 17. 
He says, take on the helmet of salvation. And then he says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Some Christians are trying to battle Satan and they don't have a sword. <laughs> they don't have the sword of the Lord. When Jesus was battling Satan in the wilderness, what did he use? The Word of God. He came at Satan with the Word of God. He came at Satan with the Word of God. If we can't have the sword of the Lord as a weapon in our arsenal, we're, we're in trouble. Can you imagine if you lived in the olden days and a guy come out with a big old sword and you're sitting there without one? Who do you think is going to win? The sword of the Spirit. There's a reason why he calls it the sword of the Spirit. That's our weapon. The Word of God. When Satan's trying to get me down, I, get, I, talk, I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I got into the Word of God and God lifted me right out of the pit. God tells me how to win the victory. Second Chronicles 20, when they start praising God, God gave them the victory. We don't understand how much praising God and lifting your arms up is the power of God coming into your life. Whenever I, I, whenever I need some power, and even when I don't need some power, I got my hands up praising the Lord. The Bible says God inhabits the, praise, the praises of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. That's an awesome, awesome verse. He is, when I start praising him, he inhabits my praises. Oh, man, that's cool. That's cool. And then the last thing I want to talk about is marriage. God created marriage to bless us, didn't he? Sure he did. I'm so glad I'm married. I'm so glad I have... Patty in my life, the Bible says that two become one. I think we become one. Um, it's a process. It, it should say two becomes one. Because people think oh, we become one. We got married. Oh, you know what, man? That might take ten years to become one. <laughs> Our lifetime. <laughs> Everything that God wants to set up, Satan wants to destroy it. He wants to divide the husband and the wife. That's Satan. Like I said before, one of the hardest times Satan came against me was to make me quit being a pastor and, and he wanted me to divorce my wife. But you guys know we had a first rough year of marriage. And I already know that that was the Lord's doing. He, he wanted to do it. Because he knew I was going to be a pastor. I didn't know it at the time. And he wanted me to be able to counsel people who were going through a hard time in marriage. So how was I going to do that if I'd never been through it? Satan hates marriage. He hates family. He wants to destroy marriages, destroy family. Kids, kids, I've seen divorces and I see how the kids are hurting. Satan wants your kids. He wants your family, he wants your kids, he wants your grandkids. I like, I, 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 got, I got so many messages, I give you parts of them every once in a while. But when Moses wanted to go, remember when Moses told, told Pharaoh, let, God said, let my people go, they want to go worship him in the wilderness? One of the things Satan said, okay, you men can go, but don't take your wives and your children. Think about it. Satan don't want your children at church. He don't want your grandchildren at church. Are we protecting our kids and grandkids? Are we? Or is it just all right if they're not here? We don't even understand it. We don't even get it. I'm so glad to see, you know, the kids in our church that are here. They need to be here. They need to be here. There's so much garbage going out in that world. And then kids, I don't care what you think, Satan's after them. You don't believe me, read the Bible. It's so sad to see some of the things going on with these kids today. That they don't have church. They don't have God's word. They don't have His truth. They don't know His love. They don't know His love. They don't know his mercy, his kindness, his favor. How different would their lives be if they knew, if they knew Jesus. 
What's Jesus say? He said, well, remember when all the little kids came and the apostles tried to shoo them away? Get out of here. Get out of here. What did Jesus say? Don't you talk to them little kids. I want bring them little kids here. Bring them kids to me. I know one thing I've seen in my life. Little kids love Jesus. They got a supernatural love that God puts in them when they're two, three, four years old. And if we don't get them in church and in the Bible, I'll tell you what, that, that, that thing goes away. It really does. It goes away. I remember my grandson Henry. Remember he said, I saw the angels. Was it Will? Okay, Will said he saw the angels when he was little. But then later on he said, I don't see them no more, Grandma. If you ever talk to little kids about Jesus, they got a supernatural love in them when they're little. And if we don't, if we don't develop it, 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 it fades away. It really does. It really does. There's, there's a time, and, and God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that the fathers should, the word of God should be in your house morning, noon, and night, and you should be teaching them diligently unto your children. And then we don't, and when tragedy happens, and bad things happen, and we didn't do our responsibility. We didn't bring them here to learn the word of God. We didn't let the word of God get into their lives, and then, then tragedy happens. They get hooked up with the wrong people, or this or that happens or whatever that we do it did we do our job did we did we do the responsibility that God gave to us and I you know I love it I remember when I used to pick up Luke from school every day and I had tracks and he sit in the back and there was a track of Satan and he goes Papa does Satan really look like that and I go well he he don't look like that, but it's just showing that he's ugly. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's an ugly person. He's just a bad person. And we talk about the Bible all the way going there and back. You know, one of the coolest stories I got about Luke is we was talking about the rapture and coming back. And I said, yeah, when, after the rapture, we're going to be with Jesus for seven years, and that's going to be the marriage feast. And then, then we're going to camp back with Jesus in the Battle of Armageddon. We're going to be on horses with swords. And he goes, Papa, you mean we're going to be riding... Horses with swords and Jesus and coming back and fighting the bad guys? I go, yeah. And he goes, Papa, I can't wait. I can't wait. And then when he got 15 years old and he was going to get his car, he said, Papa, I can wait now. I can wait. Now, don't, let that, don't let that rapture happen. I want to get my car. I want to drive my car for a while first. I said, Jesus got a Lamborghini for you up in heaven. <laughs> anyway, my message is separation. Don't let Jesus, don't let Satan separate you from the things that God brought to bless you with. Just don't. Don't. It's up to us. It's up to us to be aware of it. And you, you guys got to figure out how that works into my joke with the frog. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, mighty God, we thank you so much, Lord, for all your blessings, Lord, your great salvation, that you would pay for our sins, Lord, and Give us a free pass to heaven, Lord. What, a, what an awesome God you are, Lord. Um, can't thank you enough for saving me. Can't thank you enough for your salvation and all those that are saved. And Father, I thank you for this church and all the people here and the work we're doing here. We've seen so many people get saved and lives get changed. And uh, Lord, we pray you continue, Lord, to be with us and uh, allow us, Lord, to serve you. Um, just thank you, Lord, for... Uh, the privilege and opportunity I have, Lord, to preach the message that you preached to me Saturday morning, Lord. I, I'm just a messenger boy. Uh, you, you show me what to say, and you preach to me, and then I, and I'll bring it here, Lord. And only you know what they need to hear. I don't. And Father, I just thank you so much for, for just all you've given us, Lord. Let us, uh, let us focus on that, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. I guess we better say happy birthday to Pastor Bill. His birthday is Tuesday. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh -huh. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Yay!